and you have to bear that in mind. The other thing you have to bear in mind is that I, I don't think of myself as an author. I think of myself as a storyteller who happens to use a written format to tell the story. I, you know, I don't know if you can tell. Okay. But if I have somebody to talk to, okay, I just I, don't, I want a cup of hot chocolate or you know coffee with a little creamer in it, you know, and I'm good, I'm good. Oh look, it's three in the morning, time to go to bed. You know. But I, I I'm a storyteller. That's what I do, uh, and I'm simply telling you guys the stories in a printed page, which then gets turned into an audio book by you know half the time, um, and. This, the art of storytelling is not the same thing as the art of writing. And it's a craft, not a highbrow art form. The guys who get the literary reward sell 5,000 copies in, in hardcover from a literary press somewhere. Oh, they don't sell 5,000. <laughs> I'm being kind. Okay. I was going to say, you're going to knock a zero off there. If the, if the editorial staff all buys a copy. But I mean, I mean, seriously, seriously, you know, um, Mark Twain was not considered one of the highbrow writers of his time, okay? And then, of course, there's Will, all right, who was writing daytime soap operas to be performed in the Globe, all right? I got it. I got it one time. This is one of my favorite negative one-star reviews of all time ever. I wanted even to make this into a cover for it because the guy was one of the literati. You know, what he types it. He's reviewing Monster Hunter. He says, though Korea uses many Lovecraftian themes, he's really no Lovecraft. He's more of a modern Robert E. Howard. Oh. <laughs> oh. He said that as an insult. <laughs> make me beat me. Make me write that text. I mean, <laughs> Let's see, the guy that made up Cody and Solomon King? Yeah, I can live with that. <laughs> well, I, actually, I actually had a review. The guy just rips the book apart. And, and, and he and he gets all the way to the bottom and he says, I guess if you like H.P. Piper and C.J. Sherry, you probably like this too. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you reviewing this? <laughs> like, okay, I don't care what he said in the rest of the review. Okay, I can care less. Okay, that last sentence, okay, fine. Yeah. Frame it, put it on the wall, highlight that one. Yeah, well, I feel so bad being compared to H.P. Piper. That's just that's yeah. how long I live. Well, I, I, let, me, let me say something about, about H.P. Piper. Piper is uh, uh, an example of a writer who actually would profit to some extent by being Bob Laurent. And the reason that I say that is he was way ahead of the curve about putting women into the military. Way ahead of the curve. But the, the, the language hadn't caught up with him yet. And so, like in the other uprising, he has a reference to the girl sergeant. Okay, now this is a tough as nail sergeant. Okay, she's doing the briefing for the commander of the entire. She's got, you know, she's got her sidearm. She's got, you know, her, her rifles leaning against the wall behind her. You know, kind of thing. But because the language had caught up with where he was conceptually yet, okay, he refers to the girl sergeant. Every woman in the world reading that book in the 21st century. Is going to... <laughs> okay, and all they have to do is take that word out. And then you see what Piper was actually writing rather than what he said. You see what I'm saying? It's a teeny, tiny change. But for the, the context of a modern readership, it changes everything. A good editor will be looking for those same places in what you're doing, okay? And if you hit a, a, a false note that betrays what you were trying to do, they'll tell you that. Now, I had a copy editor at Tor who clearly, clearly thought that she was an editor, editor okay? And so she's making electronic comments on my manuscript and actually implementing the changes oh. as she goes through. Oh. And she tells me, for example, it is incorrect to refer to a ship as she or her. A ship has no gender and therefore should be it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I have a passage in here.
here where I'm talking about, you know, it took 40 men with size six hours to harvest this field. Historically, the majority of agricultural workers were actually female. Therefore, it should be laborers. Okay. It is inappropriate to refer to a country with a gendered pronoun. Okay. Well, I mean, and I'm sitting here, I'm looking at this, and, and I mean, I, and that's just one. Okay, I have a passage in here where, where Merlin Athros is thinking about the fact that the church is coming in to forcibly reestablish, you know, kind of thing in Sidermar. And he's reflecting that, you know, they're going to have the same problems that Hitler had in, in Russia, okay, except that Hitler, I mean, except that the church at least has an ideology that appealed at one time to the majority of the population. And she says to me, this is a direct quote, Hitler had a political ideology. It was called Nazism. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, like, and I actually, I got so pissed, okay, that I started going by through and answering her comment at the same time that it was changing. And I got done and I sent an email to Patrick, my editor. And when I finally thought, you know, I should actually print this out and see how long it is, I printed it out. 14 pages of eight point type. <laughs> that was my response to this copy edit. I look at this and, and, and I said, Patrick, uh, follow me, and I said, I, I, I may have overreacted. <laughs> and he sent me back an email that said, well, I've read her comments, I think actually you were pretty restrained, all things considered. <laughs> and I have made the point that she will never copy edit one of my writer's books again. Yeah, my comment would have been just really brief to inspire her. <laughs> well, I, I suggested that at several points. But I, I told him, <laughs> My, my thought when you're saying like when she's like Hitler had an ideology and it's like it's like geez read a book David. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, what I finally did is I sent back two copies of the manuscript, and in one copy of the manuscript I just said reject all comments, reject all changes, okay, <laughs> and sent it back and said why don't we try again, okay, and I also sent back one in which I had responded to the comments. <laughs> And Patrick said, I think we'll probably start over again. But they were really up against the time limit on it, too, um, because the book had come in late. It was well within their production window, but they had handed it to the next copy editor on the list rather than to somebody who had copy edited any of the earlier books. Um, and that, now it's also interesting when your editor is Jewish and wants you to change the title of your book, It's Toil and Tribulation, because marketing's going to have a problem with it, and doesn't realize that all of your titles are coming from Christian hymns. Okay? And as soon as I explained that to Patrick, he was like, oh, okay. But I mean, literally, it was just one of those little blind spots that, that he wasn't aware, because it's not his, his music. Okay? Um, and that's another thing that can happen. In an editorial, you were talking about a little bit about the difference between your humor and, and where you're coming from and where Tony's coming from. Sometimes the editor doesn't have the context for what you're doing. Sometimes the fact that the editor doesn't have the context means you need to rethink what you're doing and make sure that the context is clear. The most complicated editorial uh, conversations I've ever had to have were actually not with Tony Weisskopf, with Steve Feldberg and Otto. Specifically because of Tom Stranger audiobooks, explaining all the jokes. And he's like, I don't think, what is that? I don't understand. Just trust me. Why is this going? Just trust me. What if this is who? And like, trust me. Who's Aussie Man Reviews? Trust me. <laughs> it's like, why is this guy Arlie Ermy? Trust me. That was <laughs> like, the whole freaking conversation. There was like a hundred points of, I don't get it. I'm just going to have to just let. People seem to think this is funny. <laughs> I just made these names up. I don't know who they are. I mean, so it's, you got to get on the same page, uh, or or they got to have they got to. There's a lot of faith in each other involved in this working relationship. 
The more you do it, though, with people, when you get to the teach them the people you trust, you learn who to trust and you learn why you trust them. And the editor learns to trust you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I get away with a lot more crap than I could nine years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big time. Okay. When I named uh, Robert Stanton Pierre, Tony <laughs> did not see it coming <laughs> <laughs> until I got to the Committee of Public Safety by order of Rob S. Pierre, chairman. Um, and she was like, oh my God. <laughs> and I said, do I need to change? She said, no. I said, you got any more? And I said, yeah, there's several more together. They said, Tell me where they are. <laughs> yeah, and then she was like, okay, this is good. Okay, I got it. Now. Um, that's another thing that Tony will let you do in a serious novel. Okay? If you want to stick a little humor in there, she understands. It's like the best horror movies, I don't like horror movies, I don't like splatter movies, but the best horror movies I've ever seen incorporate humor into the horror. Oh, yeah. Okay, I love the original American Werewolf in London. That's great. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, because they understood that. Um, the other thing, that, especially when you get a series that's been going on for a while, okay, you have a relationship with your readers, all right? So you're giving them in jokes, okay? You're saying, hey guys, I knew you are going to get this <laughs> kind of thing and going along. My favorite scene in a lot of ways in Uncompromising Honor is Honor trying to feed Raul green peas. And she's like, oh. no! I get it. <laughs> but you like green peas. Forget it. <laughs> and at one point, Emily said, Hamish is like, you know, they can sense fear. And at honors, you are so not helping Hamish Donald Blaine McGregor. <laughs> and at one point, Emily says, you two do realize that you're talking about feeding a child, not fighting a battle. <laughs> and then she says, wait, forget I said that. <laughs> I thought it was truer words were never spoken. Yeah, okay. So I had, a, I had an enormous amount of fun with that scene. And it accomplishes nothing except to give you the view of honor and her home life, which is really important to understanding who she is. There's a scene where, where uh, uh, Allison is, is thanking Honor for loaning the Harrington house for a, a, a party for her mom and her dad. And Honor says, you know, I told you, you guys live here more than, more than I do these days. You know, as long as, as, long as Hamish and Emily and I have a modest seven, eight room suite when we're here, you know, you do whatever you want. To do. But it's only polite to make sure before we throw any orgies your very own orgy mother? How exciting. Can I come? And her mom says, I can see Emily's been good for you. <laughs> yeah, she has helped me get in touch with my inner Beowulf. <laughs> uh, so so you, know, you have these little moments that, 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 that you toss in there that are expressly for the reader to share and to understand that this is how this character is growing and changing but also that this is how you as the writer are including the reader who's come along for this long journey with this character in this part of her life. And that I know while I write it that there are going to be people who are going to be unfortunately drinking Pepsi when they get to the green peas. Okay? I, mean, I, just, I know it's going to happen. Um, and it, I, I need to bank little things like that for when they get to the scenes where they want to come find me with clubs and torches. <laughs> <laughs>